<laughs> but let's hear the son of a bitch deny it. Well, yeah. I mean, once he starts talking about denying that he wears a diaper, then in the minds of people who's hearing it, they have to open their imaginations to the possibility that he is. They're just thinking about the diaper, diaper all day long. They're thinking this motherfucker is wearing a diaper right now. Yeah, he yeah, starts right. looking at his pants like that's a little bunched up there. And he does have a wide and, dumper. And he, he's got a dumper, and he does wear very baggy clothes. Yeah. Oh, oh, God, those pants. And he waddles. He waddles around to these huge hammer pants. <laughs> it's the ass pennies negotiating strategy. <laughs> no, but yeah, they, 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 they should just start calling him Doddering Donald. Diaper just, Don. Diaper Don, and just talk about him like he is senile, which, yeah. you know, I think he probably is. Oh, he's clearly senile. And, like, that would drive him insane. Like, they, they don't know how to get over it. It's him. all he would talk about. Yeah. They're already, he would only talk about his poop they're his diapers. They're already not indicting him. They're not going to impeach him. And he's still trying to uh, uh, prove some, you know, point about uh, uh, how innocent he is. No yeah. collusion. Yeah. He's still posting no about it. Up. Like, yeah. that. just that alone made him go insane. Yeah. Sorry, I, I started recording, uh, Chris. Yeah, just. I wanted to get the poop comp, 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 comp yeah. content. Yeah, come out. Yeah, as Will said, uh, Will said before we were recording, the idea here is every meeting they have, Pelosi should come out afterwards and say the president shit himself. <laughs> we we could all cut, smell it, and it was. We had disgusting. to cut it short. It was. It, we could not continue talking about because the infrastructure. He, he would not then talk for the next two years. He'd go. His acceptance speech at the RNC would be about his diaper and how it doesn't exist and his fake news and how that he shits tight himself and strong all the time. His colon is never poop. I've never gone to the bathroom once. I'm 100 percent efficient. Also, imagine you know, not saying it matters, but there being a Senate impeachment trial and just how pissed off he would get at whoever he gets to represent him. So yeah, oh, I mean, God, like, yeah. this is by way of uh, our, our saying that, like Matt was saying, you know, you, we understand like the left case against impeachment, but I got to say, like I've come around on impeachment because i just think it's important to fuck with yes trump yeah. like, 100%. and like and to, to fuck with him to make him angry to make him more unhinged and most importantly to distract him from whatever he's invading iran yeah from whatever his administration would be doing otherwise you know building privatized concentration camps uh, the wall and starting a war with iran and, and the thing is like the argument against impeachment is we're trying to build a socialist movement. That means we're trying to pitch, like we're trying to make an, a pitch for new policies and a new approach to, to redistribution. And it's like, yeah, do you think that anyone in the House of Representatives is going to do that? No, fucking course not. The House of Representatives, as we'll discuss, is this just club filled with unemployable uh, dipshit fail sons and used car salesmen and absolute corrupt dipshits. and like they, CIA agents. Yeah, and they, they, they can't pass anything anyway because the Senate's Republican controlled and Trump's president. So, like, just have them troll him with hearings for the next well, yeah. two years. Meanwhile, Bernie is out there. Yeah. Let him fucking actually promote the alternative to this fucking shit show. And, like, you know, like, the, the, what brought me around on it is just how bad the arguments against doing it are, which be basically boil down to is, like, this will turn out Republican voters and Trump will fundraise and play the victim off of it. Like, like he whereas, won't do that anyway, yeah. I mean, like, someone running against him for president in 2020, he will play the victim and be like, very unfair. Yeah. They're persecuting me. Yeah, presidential <laughs> elections tend to mobilize the base of the two parties, no matter yeah. what. That's going to really do the job there. I mean, you might have a case if we were going into a midterm, but like, you're redlining turnout in presidential elections, regardless of anything else. And as I said, like, the other week on the show, like, the other big thing is like, this is, again, like 2016, all just assuming that Trump will definitely not win re-election, hmm. which is like, you know, it yeah. looks pretty bad. Uh, I mean, he's extraordinarily unpopular for uh, someone where the... It's 50-50. Yeah, it's a point I, yeah, point. Exactly. I'm, I mean, I'm out of the prediction business. Yeah, for yeah. We all, everyone elections. should be. How dare anyone fucking <laughs> say anything about what's going to happen? You shut your fucking wet but mouth. Like, so, like, you say, like, oh, we're, we're not going to impeach him because the most important thing is beating him in 2020. Well, it's like, well, what if you lose? Yeah. Like, w then you've established a precedent that there's basically nothing a president can do that you yeah. won't impeach him for. Yeah. And it's like, or I that he can't get away with. And it's like, like I actually, I, I mean, I, it's hard to care about any of that because, like, the real argument for impeachment from a non troll move is that you need to do something to push back against the erosion of these norms and. And, and rules that are just being flagrantly violated without any any kind of uh, even threat of uh, of pushback from law enforcement or or Congress. 
Yeah, but I mean, if you don't really care about that shit and you think that's fake anyway, that's not really persuasive. The persuasive argument is that he wouldn't talk about anything else at all for two years and he would just get more and more insane. He would get so mad and worked up about it. And like, you know, anything that raises his blood pressure yeah. is, I think, in the long run, uh, good. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You, could, you could kill him. Like, like you're saying that day his uh, nose is looking mad it big, looks mad like, bulbous. It looks so like pitted yeah. and like gored by yeah, like that uh, guy that putin poisoned yes in yeah, the ukrainian yeah, election yeah. and just imagine that uh, you, uh, an impeachment hearing and it just gets bigger and bigger bigger and eventually it like just pops or it turns into dan Aykroyd's nose from nothing but trouble a penis an actual okay. penis okay uh it's just a little little opening opening riffs and thoughts on impeachment but uh let's let's start the show because we have a very cool guest for you guys um Fresh out the feds, first day out. John Walker Lynn, the American <laughs> Taliban. How you been, dude? Yeah, we've got good. a lot of pop culture to catch you up on. <laughs> Forget Game of Thrones. Let's talk about Entourage. <laughs> yeah. uh, Kim Kardashian went public and uh, Edward Snowden went private. <laughs> Facebook, Facebook went <laughs> wow, that's it. God damn it. <laughs> Facebook went public. Edward Snowden went private. That's Kim it. and Kanye had a baby, so now there's another Kardashian did not keep up with That's it. That's oh. the line. So anyway, um, how you feeling, John? Any regrets? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just fooling with you. We'll be getting on him on shortly. He'll be guest hosting for us uh, while we're in Europe. But no. Uh, He's going to be Twitch streaming with Felix very shortly. Uh, but from uh, The Intercept, it's back on the show, Ryan Grimm. How you doing, Ryan? Uh, just wonderful to be here. You were uh, in person for the first time? That's right. Uh, actually, first time actually on the show. Yeah, well, actually, the last time we I saw you was in the Bronx at uh, AOC's victory party at that pool hall. Uh, Virgil and I were there. The victory at, pool party. The victory pool yes. party. And, I mean, I guess that's sort of where your book, the latest book that you have a, a book out now called the We've Got People, from Jesse Jackson to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, The End of Big Money and the Rise of a Movement, uh, your book sort of op- begins yeah. there. Yeah, I actually decided to finally pull the trigger on writing it the next day. Wow! Like I, I'm. Well, you you have your th- you have your thesis, you know. Yeah. Like, like <laughs> and all of a sudden, people cared. Yeah. Like this is this was the thing that I'd been writing about for about twelve years, starting in two thousand six, covering the the midterms, this this fight within the Democratic Party. But the the left side of that fight had been so weak for so long that people justifiably were not tuned in to the conflict until really 2015 when Bernie Sanders kind of takes off. And, you know, broadly speaking, like going off the subtitle of the book, like this inter-party conflict is between sort of the big money people and the more, you know, people-powered, you know, grassroots, movement-oriented activists and voters. Right, two theories of how you organize a party. Like the, the one theory saying... Uh, we just need to raise as much money as we can to match the Republicans, do, do whatever we need to do to do that, spend the money on consultants and good TV ads, be smart, turn out the right voters, and win a majority is that way. And the other says, let's just register lots of people and give them something to be excited about, get them to the polls and win that way. And often today people say, you know, uh, commentators say, you know, oh, what's, what's going on is a conflict between, you know, liberals and socialists, what? You're saying this predates the uh, invention of socialism in 2015. That's, that's uh, right. Our show. <laughs> yes. And, you know, like up until then, the, uh, the, the, the money theory that, you know, you, you just, you got to raise enough money to be competitive. You need to spend it on TV ads and consultants and like targeting the right people. Like it's it not, not totally an insane way to run a, a modern political party, is it? Right. And it wasn't always the way that the party operated. So, up until the 1970s or so, you know, you had, they had labor backing. Mm-hmm. They had some. They had some money, but the the scale of money in politics wasn't what it was. So that a lot of these senators were spending just a handful of thousands of dollars to win re-election. People like Frank Church and Birch Bay, who just kind of just coasted on their uh, kind of lion status. And then when Reagan came in, uh, Newt Gingrich and the like new right rose up in 78, 80. And they got wiped out of the Senate, wiped out of the White House. They still had the House. And they felt like they were going to control the House forever. Like they, they felt like they had an impenetrable wall around that thing. And so they, they used it. They went to Wall Street. They went to other you know, corporate interests and said, look, we've got the House. You, know, you need to pay us. Mm-hmm. And you know, we're not necessarily going to give away the store. But because we're in power, Annie up. Pay and, me, and, Yeah. 
and that 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 obviously evolves in the direction that you would expect it to and and brought the brought that wing of the party to where it is now but in some ways it was an, an accidental response to them getting wiped out in 1980 but the, the very beginning of the book begins with AOC's uh, surprise victory over Joe Crowley but like the, the real like that sort of comes full circle You're, the real narrative of the book begins with Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition which is you know something I think like most people have totally forgotten about so like why did you why did you begin with Jesse Jackson and like what have people forgotten about his presidential campaign well part of it was his his theory sounds so familiar which was register more voters give them something to care about and have them come out and vote but what people don't understand is that there was a moment in that campaign in 1988 where he was neck and neck with Dukakis for the nomination it happened after Michigan he was he was expected to lose Michigan. This is 37, 38 primaries and caucuses in. So they're, they're deep into this campaign. Mm -hmm. Losers like Al Gore and Joe Biden had been pushed aside mm -hmm. by then. It's just, it's Gebhardt, Dukakis, and Jackson going into Michigan. And Jackson wins this stunning upset and pulls basically within a delegate tie with Dukakis. And Democrats in Washington just have a complete meltdown, figuring out, okay, what are we going to do if Dukakis does not stop Jackson? First idea they have is they're going to send Mario Cuomo to the convention and <laughs> <What>? draft him <laughs> there. That was their that oh, was their, wow. that was their plan D. That was like the, if not if nothing else works, the we're best gonna, man Cuomo. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna stop him at the convention with with Cuomo, um, and the, the 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 vitriol just comes down on him, and then the electability arguments just mm -hmm. pour out. They're just very explicit. America will not elect a black man. Mm. Uh, they will not elect this black man. Uh, Michael Dukakis is the electable candidate. And th he, Jackson was polling well ahead of, in Wisconsin, which was the, the next state. You know, he goes to Wisconsin. He ha has this like rainbow rally, talks about the economic violence that uh, neoliberalism is doing to workers, black and white, rural and urban. Uh, and he gets crushed in Wisconsin, even though he's polling well ahead. This is one of the first instances of that of that phenomenon, um, and so he he fades from there. But in between Michigan and Wisconsin, there was a very real possibility that he was going to actually steal that nomination, which changes the kind of course that the party takes from there. So you're firmly in the camp that you know the, the Democratic Party. I mean, our, our political system fundamentally went fundamentally was realigned in the '80s and '90s. Because you can see the wheels coming off the Democratic coalition mm -hmm. post seventies, and it's 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 also you know it's 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 uh, and, and and correct me if any of this is wrong, but my idea of what the Democratic Party looking like in the eighties, it's it's still a, this uh, coalition of uh, uh, white working class ethnics in the Midwest, the North, and such. You know, black voters uh, of a post civil rights movement, l educated liberals, and still Southern segregationists. You know, like post civil yeah. rights movement segregationist and that's not a coalition that seemed destined to to continue to function and then you also have the 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 labor movement still in a, a major part of that coalition which has been in in now that Reagan's in office a rapid decline uh the the white working class ethnics they flock to Reagan uh it wins two big election victories and 94 is when what the southern whites just Start leaving right, that's what that, the federal that's level. when the wheels completely come off of it. And even in October of '94, uh, Democrats felt like it was going to be bad. Sure, people were mad at Hillary Care and mad at all the other things Clinton had done wrong, but they they didn't they didn't think they were going to lose the House. They were surprised that that they lost that. And so, in hindsight, we say like, yeah, Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act. The parties shifted, and and all the white people left. But as, it, as you were living through it, every, every midterm cycle, you could say, okay, yeah, they're fleeing, but if we just raise enough money and yes. spend it in the right ways, we can win back these Reagan Democrats. The fact that they st we still talk about Reagan Democrats to this day, this is mm -hmm. somebody who's been a Republican for 30, 40 years at this point, and we call them Reagan <laughs> Democrats. It's like, no, these are not, but they were doing the same thing then. So while the labor movement is d dying, and while, as this coalition is disintegrating, there's another thing going on, and that's just money increasingly being pumped into politics. And uh, what I what I took away from your book is that generally the reaction from the you know the 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 head honchos of the uh, Democratic Party, the Washington types, and the consultants, and so on, was 
okay, you know, this rickety coalition is just fracturing, it's falling apart, and, the, you know, the same old magic isn't there anymore. Maybe if we just get a shitload of money, that's just <laughs> yeah, going to make, so make up for it. Instead of, you know, together. going, and we definitely can't go to any kind of, like, a populist Jackson-type politics that might be able to forge a n- totally new coalition that would have a strong majority. Right. Instead of going back a step and saying, okay, we'll double down on, on working class politics, labor politics, and hope to paper over the, the, the simmering racial yeah. divides, uh, we'll go the opposite direction. We'll just go to this, this professional managerial class and we'll go to Wall Street, we'll go to the big business and we'll just suck up the money and we'll just, our elections will increasingly get, you know, just yeah. a, a wash in these, you know, uh, contentless you know, campaign messaging and all very scripted consultant based shit and you used to, i remember you used the example in the book of this this southern senator democratic senator who uh like for the first time he was facing like a difficult re-election campaign against a republican like this was you know when that became a thing this was before you know if you're a democrat you're golden in the south and he had his last election raised what two hundred dollars right. and this time he all the washington consultants come and say we've, we've got to save your campaign yeah it, john, 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 john stennis uh, white supremacist it was his his 82 campaign against Haley Barber, actually, like a 35-year-old Haley Barber or something. He, yeah, he'd raised nothing in like five, five re-elections before that. They come in and they're like, you will need $2 million to prove, you know, get, get up on TV, just show people that you're alive. And you I'm still, still racist, I promise. Yeah, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm, still pro- I, I'm still racist, I can still walk. That's all, like, that's, that's all, that's all they're asking for. And he's like, $2 million, how can I raise $2 million? And they're like, well, aren't you like the top Democrat on the Armed Services Committee? You know, what about these uh, weapons makers that are back in your state? And he's like, that wouldn't be proper. Wow. And he ends up doing it anyway, but he, (laughs) (laughs) and he raised a couple million dollars and he beats Haley Barber and he serves uh, another six years and retires at like 90 in 1988. Uh, But yeah, that- miracles can't happen. Miracles can't happen. Uh, This is a guy, he was as a, prosecutor he was responsible for a landmark uh supreme court case i think in the 30s which outlawed confessions extracted from torture because he had convicted uh black defendants based on confessions extracted from torture acknowledged it and said that's fine and it went to the supreme court and and this is when the supreme court effectively outlawed torture as a means of extracting confessions uh, and so th- it's it's this same guy who then in 1982 is saying like yeah okay actually I'll, I'll raise the couple million dollars and we'll keep and we'll keep a Democrat in the Senate for another six years rather than trying to figure out some other path forward. And now he's got an aircraft carrier named after him. He does right. Yeah. yeah. Um, funny you bring up um, confessions extracted under uh, police torture and interrogation uh, because another big character in the book is uh, Rahm Emanuel who now just left. <laughs> Uh, office as the mayor of Chicago uh, to get a cush job at the Atlantic, which I want to get into in a bit. But where, how does Rom figure in this book? Because you said you sort of started telling this story in 2000. You started sort of looking into this. If we're finding this story in 2006 during the midterm yeah. elections, of which at the time Rom was what like the triple C chair. Yeah. chair. And like, what was the strategy that like he brought to bear in 2006? Yeah, as this realignment is happening, Rom is you know he's he's a, a we're seeing it through the lens of his career in your book. Yeah, and and Rom is kind of the main character uh, in, a POV in, character. in the book. Yes, <laughs> uh, his first campaign, 1980, um, where he's uh, he he tries to beat the Republican who is Arafat's best buddy in the in the House of Representatives. Well, you're saying like it's, it seems odd to now, but like this is like a different era in politics where like across parties you could sort of like have your faves in foreign countries yes. like there's like republicans who are like yeah i support arafat the or plo's man Tur- in washington yeah, plo or turkey or whatever and taking uh, him out was apac's first win so and dick, and the, dick and durbin ended up beating him in 82 that was apac's and first like that that was rom's first job in politics yeah. you said that he like his first job was a fundraiser as a 20 year old fundraiser he was so he was just so Psycho good at shit. it <laughs> yeah people good who lord people who knew him then he'd be like 22 he'd see like the commerce secretary bub what's going on how you doing like back, like just back slapping like he just absolutely belonged there so he never even had an idealistic phase that he grew out of or anything he was just a lizard from the jump but he was raised with one and you know idealism takes different forms his dad was an irgun 
which well, he volunteered <laughs> for the IDF, right? He volunteered yeah. for the IDF during the Gulf War. Uh, his, Ra, uh, Ram Israel Emanuel, his father was a, was a terrorist. Um, <laughs> True, which no, no, it, no. you know it means he believed in something. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, no, 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 ma'am. Uh, his father was a good person. <laughs> <laughs> An American. <laughs> and his mother was a civil rights activist. Uh, and, you know, he talks about the, the kind of social justice conversations they'd have around the table. Uh, and so, you know, he was in it for the cause of, of Israel in that first campaign, 1980. Uh, you know, so he, he, what, he did believe in something at that point. Um, but so by 2006, he's a, he's a proponent of the idea that if you're going to win the House, you need to find the, the most right-wing guy you can find who will call himself a Democrat and, and run them in, all, in all, of these, all of these districts. And what he was so good at was pretending to the press that that strategy worked. But if you actually explore the numbers, they won on an anti-war wave with mm. Rahm Emanuel insisting that none of his candidates could, uh, could say they opposed the war. And the ideal candidate would be a vet, you know, a vet, you know, the, uh, a vet yeah. who has sort of, uh, I don't know, tactical critiques about the war in yeah. Iraq. Yeah, yeah, they wanted to change direction. Like that yeah. was their phrase. We Blue want a dog, new direction in Iraq. Blue dog vets, county sheriffs, NFL quarterbacks, anyone who could sell fun. NFL quarterbacks, He's bad Schiller, NFL baby. quarterbacks. And the, the, you know, it's the, their strategy has evolved. It used to be anti-gay vets. Now they now it's gay veterans, <laughs> but, but but essentially and it's a, it's a relatively short progress. amount of time. So that's it's progress. Yeah, that is progress. Yeah. yeah so in, in 2006, yeah, like the Democrats, they they do take back with uh, they take back ba- to, both the house. They take back the house and the Senate in 2006. But as you were saying, like Rom's genius is sort of convincing people that you know he is like the 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 man the power broker the guy who pulls the strings and has the the plan or whatever but as you point out there was a broad feeling of by 2006 of like disgust and you know fear about where the iraq war was going and that people did not want to continue like the, right this was the, like the insurgency was like roiling the country and this was like years after you know mission accomplished and bush was deeply unpopular and republicans had a pedophile in the house the who, mark foley yeah, yeah who was exposed at the at, toward the very end tom delay was on his way to prison like yeah it was a really hard election to screw up and he screwed up a ton of <laughs> races and he, so he there, there and i go through a bunch of the examples in the book where he would say this right-wing democrat is the only one who can win this district and then the a left-wing democrat would beat him he would walk away from the race, and Ron would say, we're done with this race. We're not spending a dime. We're going to lose it. And then the progressive wins the general election. It, it happened an embarrassing amount of times. Uh, New Hampshire was a good one. Yeah, Carol Shea, Carol Shea Porter. Who raised very, very little money. And right. was abandoned Anti-war. By on an anti, anti-war. Aband- John Hall, a, a musician in upstate New York, abandoned. Uh, McNerney out in California. And uh, so, McNerney's still, still in Congress. John Yarmouth. Uh, Still Rom had no idea he was going to win. He's now the budget chairman. Like the, a lot of Carol Shea Porter just left. Like these are not people who yeah. like won and then got run. Well, out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, how, yeah. how would that compare to the record of like Rom's guys? You know, like all the, wiped the, out in twenty ten. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the yeah, yeah. The few good men they style. Came, and, Democrats. and that's the thing. They came in. They voted against Obamacare. They voted against mm. cap and trade. They voted against the spending bills. Uh, voted against repealing "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." You name it, and then they all lost. Mm-hmm. So I was like, thanks. They lost the 2010 way. They, 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 sh- they shrunk the size of the stimulus, you know, which, which ramped up unemployment, and then they get wiped out. So for a, a blissful four years there, it seemed like the Democrats had picked the electoral lock and that they've, they've finally been able to dominate the new, you know, this new realigned, you know, six-party system or whatever you want to call it, um, without having to resort to a, a multiracial working mm-hmm. class becoming like following the lead of, of a rainbow coalition that Jesse Jackson proposed. And after Obama won, put an exclamation point on that victory. It did seem like for a time that you know, that all that Jesse Jackson, stuff would, that would just be a footnote and we'll just have a permanent Democrat majority in electoral college. Right. And it, in, in some strange ways that Obama coalition was the one that Jesse Jackson wanted to put together, uh, you know, it's, which was, you know, progressive whites, um, black, Hispanic, uh, LGBT uh, with 
than a ton of Wall Street money thrown mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that wasn't the part that Jesse Jackson wanted. But, in, you know, they've been chasing that coalition ever ever since then. But, and that's, but that's the precise one that Jesse Jackson pointed to and said, if, if you can pull these people together, you know, you're, you're, the, you're a majority party. And it turns out that it was really completely tied to the specific, first the specifics of the economic collapse happening right as the election is happening. Mm-hmm and the specific person of Barack Obama. Because yeah. they went in in 2016 thinking, we've got this figured out. Right. We don't need to rock the boat. We just slap another coat of paint on Hillary Clinton and have her do the Obama thing. And it just, there was no traction because she's not Obama and literally nobody is. Right. And people overlook this unique event, which was Obama saving Detroit. Like that, like the fact that he went in, Republicans wanted Detroit to go bankrupt. Mm, you know, yeah. Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney baby. famously headlined his column in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, let Detroit go bankrupt. Obama says, no, I'm going to take a political risk. I'm going to save these auto companies. That, that bought him 2012. Like mm-hmm. that, with, without, without that, who knows you know, how that ends up going, or without them nominating this cartoon plutocrat of, of Romney. But then by 2016, none of that goodwill is drifting to, yeah. to Hillary Clinton. She, yeah, she they, they don't do see with her. You know. she, she didn't talk about and it. They, that's and sure. they suspect she probably would have let him go under. <laughs> probably would have. So uh, take us to, to uh, you talk about in your book, 2009, 2010, Democrats have uh, at varying points a 60 vote filibuster proof majority in the Senate, massive, massive majority in the House. And Rahm Emanuel is the chief of staff. Right, guy keeps uh, but just, uh, being brought in. So yeah, like so he was D- he was the head of the DCCC. So like he technically did his job. They they won uh, the House and Senate in two thousand six. Then yeah, Obama names him chief of staff. But like before that, you were telling me not only was it like Rom, you know, picking these candidates or his guys, but it was also like ignoring everyone who was a progressive or liberal. But like anytime a blue dog picked up the phone to him, he was on the other end of the line. It, it, it's it's striking. Yeah. And and he'd come right down to the Capitol too. And in Wa- Washington, there's there's all kinds of theater. You know who you know who goes who goes, who goes to who? And who goes to who means yeah. everything. Uh, any blue dog has any problem. Rom's in his little sedan, zipping zipping down Pennsylvania Avenue. You know what what can I what can I do for you? Stimulus is too big. How about we take 150 billion off it? That, how's that? Okay, two. How about 200? 200 billion. We'll take 200 billion off of it. Progressives. Uh, it's the it's the complete opposite. Rom is talked about as this tough guy. You know, who's really going to you know crack some knuckles. He swears. Can yeah. you believe he it? He swears. He says bad words. Uh, the only time he brings that force to bear is with the left. Yeah. He, he, Those are the people he yeah. called the R word. It wasn't yeah. the Republicans. Yeah. Right. And that was because Move On and some other groups were, were running ads urging blue dogs to vote for Obama's budget. And Obama's spending bill, and Rom flipped out on them. Uh, got some stories in the book of of people getting called into the White House and told, "Stop it! Like if if you continue with this, we're going to go to your funders and we're going to shut down this little progressive group that you've got." Like, we've got this. Stop agitating. Don't push Republicans. Don't push Democrats. It's interesting because in a lot of the Obama apologia. Uh you know, uh, his apologists paint him as a guy who actually did want to, you know, fundamentally transform the country, but was just so constrained by, you know, a few senators and a few blue dogs <laughs> in the House. But you're you're painting a different story that Obama's own consigliere was the one just saying, we're, no, we're this is the direction we're going. Yeah. And there's there's a debate that still goes on about you know, what you could have done to get 60 votes for a better stimulus or 60 votes for this or that. But in the, in the book, I, I just step away from that a little bit and say, what if Obama had actually brought his army to Washington? Mm-hmm. What if instead of shutting down OFA, which was his yeah. you know, grassroots Putting it under the DNC. Put it on the DNC, mothballing it. Uh, in fact, it's Beto O'Rourke's campaign manager is the one who was uh, assigned the task of executing. <laughs> <laughs> executing <laughs> order 60. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Taking all the other behind the bar. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, she's the one that was, whose job it was to, to shelve that thing. Um, what if instead of doing that on election night or uh, inauguration, say, you know, I, I want 10 million people to demand that we do X, Y, and Z yes. and we're going to, and we're going to make this happen. There were people talking about the end of the Republican party. I remember, that, I remember yeah. feeling yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. I was, did too. I remember, uh, you know, after the 2008 election, watching, uh, Gore Vidal watching the returns. And so there's, he was being filmed and someone asked him like, uh, what do you think of this? And he goes, 
And I think the Republicans are as dead as the Whigs of yesteryear. <laughs> and they will never win another election again. Uh, it felt that way. And they, they telegraphed right away that their strategy to come back was to vote against everything. Yep. Like, yeah. No McConnell matter what. Said it. They did not they did not hide it. Yeah. And Obama's response was let's not push them. Like when McConnell said that, Marmar or top <laughs> the economy was still in fucking free fall. Yeah. He was shedding jobs at a, at a stunning like a rate. A million jobs a month. And he's like, our number one priority is demanding him a second term. If yeah. we, it's like, that's just breathtakingly sociopathic and out in the open. And yet they were still like, no, these are the guys we have to deal with. I saw, okay. I saw an article the other day uh, quoting Brahm Emanuel from around 2009 saying, I don't give a shit about judges. We're not spending political <laughs> right. capital <laughs> on judges. What yes. do they have to well, do with that? I mean, th right. this goes to he the point care. about Rahm Emanuel as a character. You know, uh, famously, his brother, Ari Emanuel, is the hotshot Hollywood agent of which the Ari yeah, character. His brother, Entourage, Jeremy Piven, yes. His, his brother, Jeremy Piven, yes. Uh, and that, like, you know, he relishes the role of being, like, that guy. Yeah. Being, like, the fuck you guy. Yeah. The guy who gets you in a room and screams at you. But, like, but, but ultimately does it in your benefit and is, like, just wants you to win. Yeah. Like, he just wants you to win. Done. Right. You just fucking like, yeah. children, you babies. You don't understand what reality is like out here. And, you know, he's, oh, he's, he's, he's a tough guy. He, like, during the auto bailout debate, he said, oh, fuck the UAW. <laughs> <laughs> That's him. Yeah. And, yeah, like, you know, uh, fuck the haters. Like, I know it's right. But, like, ultimately... Like I'm the guy in charge, and like I, I like this is politics, and I know how to play hardball, and I know how to get shit done and win, and like that's his extremely cultivated self image. But like I think the, the revealing thing about him is that he, what he's really good at is convincing people that he's that guy, and staying in the room despite the fact that like the manifest failures of all of his political ma ma machin machinations. And part of it, there wasn't a real alternative media at the time. The you know, Politico, Politico didn't even exist in 2006. The Huffington Post was sort of around, but it was just a blog. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't, but you didn't have like New York Magazine and TNR and like all of these other outlets that will post hot takes about, you know, what the Democratic establishment is doing wrong. There's certainly there was no intercept at that time. And so it was just basically the New York Times and the Washington Post telling the, the story. Oh, I remember all the stories about Rahm Emanuel just, were just fawning, like, look, in this war room, yelling, hollering at people, doing swears. My God, right. this guy is just, he's got it by this, his fists. And, it, it, and there's the, a book that comes out of it uh, called The, the Thumpin, which is... <laughs> the Thumpin? The Thumpin. Uh, a reporter from the Chicago, I believe, uh, follows him around. And just catches all his swears. And like he's on the phone swearing. And he's in the room swearing. And he's in the airport swearing. And you're like, wow, I this remember, guy. Uh what like Obama gave like a you know, like a, a roast or a dinner in, in Rom's honor, and he told the story about how Rom lost like the tip of his finger in a deli slicer yeah, accident when he was a teenager. He worked at Arby's. At Arby's. Yes. Oh, we, we, they, he has the meat. They, they have his <laughs> They have his meat. So he like cut off the tip of his middle finger and Obama said uh, he lost uh, his middle finger, uh, which rendered him nearly speechless. <laughs> it's just like a pretty funny line. But, he, was, yeah. he was pretty good at that. Yeah. yeah. So that was the, the last best chance the Democrats got to legislate. They didn't, they didn't push for card check. They uh, let Acorn, uh, uh, ironically, a, a, a community organizing coalition uh just totally got you know destroyed right and there was a push to do okay we can't get rid of the filibuster yet because we've got 58 senators who won't agree to it you can do budget reconciliation which is what the republicans did mm. to try to repeal obamacare to do their tax cuts and so there was a push put climate change in the in in reconciliation so you only need 50 votes to do it they they, they don't do it like all, they had all of these different levers that they could have pulled and they just decided no, that's not fine. to pull. That's a big deal with climate yeah. change. That's all right. Sorry. Right. We got right. time for that. What's that? A, a, oh, I just... Oh, the, the capital of the U.S. state is gone now. What happened? <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, we're fine. Well, 2008, you know, it did kind of look like the end of the Republican Party. Like, that uh, Democrat House majority was a genuine national majority, rural, suburban, uh, urban... Indiana, for God's sake. Yes, Idaho. Idaho. Obama won Idaho. Uh, then 2010... Republicans win, what, 62 seats back to just, take back the House? And, you know, the Democrats managed to keep the Senate just because of a few Tea Partiers. Yeah, and because only a third of the seats are up, That's you know, which always saves the Senate in these wave years. Uh, then 2014, of course, the Democrats lose the Senate despite Obama's re-election. They're losing all of these, these state legislative seats, losing governor's mansions and all that stuff. 
Um, and then and there tw- were there were White House aides who were okay with that outcome <laughs> because Reed I feel fine. and Obama were at such loggerheads that they were like, you know what? What do we need Reed for? He's just he just causes us some real problems and of the, course the so supreme, that, yeah. because everyone on the supreme court is the hale and healthy 35 right. yeah they're gonna be fine. there's no chance any of them might just die suddenly at a ranch uh, while doing pizzagate crimes allegedly <laughs> but you'd have to you'd have to care about judges what was the conflict with reed yeah what was the what was the tension between reed and, and the and the obama White House? reed is was is a fascinating character is reed really is, is one yeah. of the few like a dirt a dirt poor background with mormon family boxer he was an amateur boxer yeah Believes, uh, is inspired play, the Dick by, Smothers character. Played by Dick Casino. Smothers in Casino. Uh, was tell a, me I was at the dinner, Senator. He was a car bomb. W- yeah, yeah. Yes. wore a wire uh, when he was getting did bribed. Wear a wire. Uh, believes in UFOs and uh, funneled money to investigate them with U.S. government funds. And in 2012, he jumped on a grenade and said, yeah, I saw Mitt Romney Sachs return. And said he yes. wrote off his uh, penis enlargement. <laughs> that, 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 was, that, was <laughs> yeah, that was an interview with me, actually. I was like, are you really saying this? <laughs> Like, so no, but he's one of the few guys who, as he got older, moved left. Um, yeah, and ch- socially and economically a- across the board, quite. And a lot of it, and I interviewed him for this book, and he, and a lot of it he, was his staff. Like he started hiring these like actual lefties and like people from like weird movement backgrounds that just absolutely don't belong in a normal Senate majority leader's office, and so they started treating it mm-hmm. like like a weapon like, that uh, Democrats don't don't ever do they don't actually wield power but uh but but reed did and so they they started calling out the white house you know privately and and publicly uh and that just drove the white house absolutely batshit and as an aside you know you uh you know there's not enough press i think about exploring like the actual people on these staffs who wield you know a, a great deal of power collectively and you mentioned uh even though jesse jackson lost his campaign he got this sop where you know a lot of his you know a lot of members of his coalition ended up uh you know in washington in 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 with jobs and positions yeah and also when when you run a campaign like that that like gets people fired up different types of people get into politics who other who otherwise wouldn't have like Luis Gutierrez is is one of them. He, he hmm. Harold Washington won the uh, a mayoral election in 1983 against the against the machine. Uh, in fact, after he after he won the this insurgent primary with the backing of the DSA, all the the Democratic machine flipped and backed the Republican in the general election, and he only won by like two or three percent in the in the general. Uh, but that kind of radicalized Luis Gutierrez, who was just a social worker at the time. He then becomes a city council member and kind of breaks the back of the machine with a special election uh, but but people like him then get behind the jackson campaign and, and yeah then they start populating all these other all these other places that that you know create at least the possibility for some shakeup. So, so it's uh 2015 uh democrats i mean the republicans control all of these state legislatures and the the house and senate and but everyone's still kind of laughing at the tea party and it looks like it's going to be Hillary, and there's no way she can lose. Look at Obama's back to back victories. Count the rings. Yeah, and look at all these the seventeen you know douchebags that are running in the Republican. And, and oh man, it looks like Trump might actually <laughs> win the nomination. Let's see what we can do to boost him so that he's the nominee. Because then we're golden. Yeah, and you have this guy Bernie Sanders who might very well just end up the next Jesse Jackson. This this historical curio during the the reign of Hillary. Yeah, and and uh, <laughs> Sanders actually was one of. He and Paul Wellstone were basically the only two prominent-ish uh, white liberals who mm. backed Jesse Jackson. He was Burlington mayor then, and Wellstone was a professor. <laughs> uh, uh, but, but right, yeah. And Bernie didn't want to run. Like he, he was nudging all kinds of Warren and others to try to run so that somebody would you know, put up a challenge to Clinton and at least get a message out there. And finally, it's like, okay, Yeah, he uh, announced run. his campaign during his lunch break. <laughs> during his lunch break. <laughs> Literally during his lunch break it, in Washington, like didn't I mean later he did it in Vermont, but his actual announcement is just out. He walked outside the Senate, talked to a few microphones and cameras, said I'm running for president. In 24 hours, he raised a million dollars from that launch. That and that's when I was like, oh, that that was weird. Uh, yeah, and no, it was actually it was Senator Wellstone's support of Jesse Jackson was the reason a, a stinger missile was yes. fired at his point. Yeah. No, just, just, 
Just kidding. Am I? I but, don't know. But before we get before we get to the readings, I do want to uh, complete yeah. the narrative, though. So your book uh, covers the uh, <clears throat> unpleasantness of 2016. <laughs> sure. Uh, but then what happens? What's what's how the Democrats Democrats in disarray now? Well, there's there's there ends up being a similar to how Jackson created a new wave of people getting into politics. The Sanders campaign uh, brought in weirdos uh, like Troy Cott Chakrabarty, who's now Ocasio Cortez's chief of staff, uh, Corbin Trent, who's now her communications director mm-hmm. and who was a, a food truck op- operator, uh, Alexander Rojas, who's now the head of Justice Democrats, was a community college organizer. All, a ton of these people joined the, the Sanders campaign in kind of a renegade way and set up their his his distributed organizing when they all when the campaign ends they all then form justice democrats they they go out they recruit ocasio cortez and so like out of the sanders campaign comes this this effort and a, you know, a bunch of them have now gone back to the sanders campaign to try mm-hmm. to redo it but there are and you cover this uh, intensely there 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 were all of these left primary challenges going on in 2018 most of them were unsuccessful but the uh, I can't imagine that being the case when someone like Rahm is in charge of D-Trip where you can run these campaigns and actually get competent staff. There were all right. of these these renegade consultants who uh, heard, you know, oh, well, if you work for XYZ, you know, you'll be locked out forever and said, well, fuck it. I don't give a shit. Right. Right. And I and I think that's what that's the kind of infrastructure that D-Trip is kind of accidentally setting up now by saying that if if you work with the uh, primary uh, contender that you can't get any money from the party for it, for anything else. They're they're going to create a parallel industry of of people who know how to run campaigns mm-hmm. and are not beholden or dependent on the party at all. So, so and it's also like like a like an infrastructure in that like if you have progressive policies that you'd like to see enacted in government, you almost have no choice but to run a people based campaign because they're going to shut you out of any money or right. consultant or right. or like any of the official. Uh, you know, systems or you know conduits for you know putting Democrats in office. They're they're flatly saying like we're we, you you it is you cannot run a primary against the Democrats. Right. Yeah. They've just straight up have said it, and it's easy to to clown on consultants, but every campaign needs them. Yeah. You need some of them. You need somebody who's going to file your FEC forms. You need somebody who knows how to like put together a mailer and make sure it gets in people's mailboxes. Like, not just everybody knows how to do that. Yeah. And they're not inherently uh, corrupt just because they're consultants. So what is the left civil war now? What, what, is, what is the state of the Democratic Party, the intra-party fighting? Uh, who are, we've got people. Who are these people? Well, a lot of these people that we've got don't vote. Um, and so that's, that's the, the challenge that has never really been met by, by the left. And it's, 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 the, it's, the the, it's the theory that Bernie you know, is bringing to, this, to the presidential election that that his kind of grassroots distributed organizing approach of of giving people something to vote for can can expand the electorate. That's and that that really is is the test because if if you don't, then you then you don't got people and they do have money, and money will beat not people. Well, we do have that test. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the test is going to be in the Democratic primary now. And interesting fact, I, I don't know if it was you who reported this, but um, I'm sure you knew this that. Uh, Beto's Senate campaign used Bernie's organized right. model. It right. was just this kind of like decentralized, you know, distributed organized. And it was, organizing. And it was Bernie's, Bernie's people. And Bernie uh, didn't really know anything about what was going on with this decentralized distributed thing. And uh, his, his campaign manager, Jeff Weaver, didn't like it. They just kind of just did it. And the difference with Beto, they, some of the same people from Bernie's campaign, they pitched to Beto. And to Beto's credit, he was like, that sounds good. So I just drive around the state on like Facebook Live and like talk to people and you'll handle everything else. Do I okay. get to stand on the tables? Get stand on whatever you want, like skateboard, air drum. It, it worked perfectly for him. One of the big stories in the, these early stages of the Democratic primaries is uh, all of these, you know, establishment friendly candidates clamoring to say, oh, I no, I love Medicare for all. I, 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 I want to abolish ICE. I uh, guillotine gritty, right? That's what you like. <laughs> uh, does that, I mean, is that just pandering or does that mean that, you know, maybe something from the, the, the Sanders from the left populist wing is winning? Yeah, I mean, almost all politics is pandering. Uh, so, yes, but that's fine. Like if 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 you can lock them in on that, then great, but uh, there's a, there's an extraordinary amount of effort 
on the on the side of the corporate wing, the third ways and the others to to pull them back from that. Okay, yeah, yeah, you said Medicare for all. What you meant is that everybody kind of has the access. option of access <laughs> when they're 65 to <laughs> Does the to Democratic Medicare. Party today look any closer to reimagining its coalition in in the time in the years that you've been covering this closely? Yes, I mean they, they despite what you might think uh because you hear so much focus about white guys and diners, it, it's far less than it was in, in 2006. Mm-hmm. In 2006, that, that's, all, that's all it was, that guy. Now there is, like even among the, the center-right consultant class, a, a recognition that you, you, you have to have a, a broader base, that, 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 that's, that that's not the answer. So, so yes, and also the, the, the party has moved a lot. Mm-hmm. Like the, thi- the things, like the fact that the sellout position now is public option or is, is Medicare buy-in. That's, that's huge. Like that was the, that was the left edge position among house members just 12 years ago. Well, uh, to, to return now to, uh, to Rahm Emanuel, uh, just to, 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 you know, fill in the gaps in his story, white house chief of staff. And then his next big job was mayor of Chicago, which he just departed from that job. Did it, he he I mean, fixed he did, all the problems. He fixed all the problems. Right off into the sunset. You know, and, I mean, you know, he did preside over, you know, a, a murder cover-up yeah. and probably the worst major police force in America, which is really saying something in the Chicago PD. Mass, mass closing of uh, public schools. Let's but, not forget that's that. That's also good. So Ron brought... He operated some kind of churning uh, machine meant to grind up the poor <laughs> and turn uh, Chicago from... Well, it's like... I, I, well, fuck. I, I guess we never released the footage from our Chicago live show so people won't understand this reference. But, you know, try to turn the city from this this... This this horrifying uh, 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 maelstrom of violence that that Airbnb host warned us about <laughs> uh, into like some kind of like Disneyfied Times Square. World class city. That was yeah. his phrase. World class city. Uh, you can see, uh, yeah, you can see sort of evidence of you know the things Rom does believe in. I suppose in his tenure as mayor, but just recently, just now, uh, immediately out of office, he has immediately got a job. As a columnist for the Atlantic, of course. God, I love the Atlantic, <laughs> and it's just you know, sort oh, of welcome so with open arms. Neoliberal de Beek, I call it, into and it's still true. The liberal media, and you know, he, he's the first article he did was like a, a sort of a pan to Pete Buttigieg, but that was he was like a, <laughs> a contributor then, and he was just like the point of that article was like being gay is the least interesting thing about Mayor Pete, and then went on to just you know talk about like how he's the perfect candidate and you know like people need to start taking him seriously he's the future of the democratic party so now he's officially been hired as a full-time columnist and i really would love your thoughts on this piece uh ryan because it's i mean based on everything we said like it's incredible the title of this piece is called it's time to hold american elites accountable for their abuses (laughs) it's so good (laughs) It's so I good. I mean, he, <laughs> they, I mean, he, they covered up a murder of, of someone when you have a teenager when he was mayor. And he was involved in yeah, it. Yeah, he was yeah. personally involved in it. Per- oh, and like, you, you, I mean, you, you, the, you pointed this out, that the reporter who broke that story is now waiting tables. Yeah, he's, he's serving coffee at a hotel in, in Washington. He's, he's, do, he's still doing freelance work on the uh-huh. side. But yeah, he he's, does not have a full-time journalism job. The reporter who broke that, broke that story... Um, got got the video loose from from Rom's hands. So and that, well, yeah, and then and, now, and, and now Rom has and it didn't he back a bunch of just these white elephant fucking development projects, like oh, something yeah. with DePaul University, some mil- zillion dollar fucking facility, and and oh and, yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, like obviously like every other big city, Maryland, fucking like developers just write their housing policy and it all that shit. Took hundreds of millions of affordable housing money and just wouldn't spend it. <laughs> just he would literally rather not spend the money. So Ram is back now with his, you know, very cush, high profile byline in the Atlantic saying that American elites need to be held accountable. And it says here, if Democrats want to address simmering middle class anger, they need to deliver justice. So I just want to read from a, a couple of selections <laughs> from this piece. Here. We must nominate Darkwing Duck. <laughs> so he begins by talking about the uh, the college admissions scandal. And he says the outrage over the Varsity Blues investigation perfectly illustrates what may be the most important, least understood, and underappreciated political dynamic of our era, a full-on middle-class revolt against the elites and the privileges they hoard. I mean, 
a, a, mm, a middle class revolt against sort of decadent elites. <laughs> mm. they, they're very angry. Yeah. Uh, so he goes, uh, the privileges they hoard. For all the focus on inequality and social justice, <laughs> this middle class revolt is the most important barrier standing between Democrats and the White House. They can't afford to ignore it. Think of what's happened over the past decade and a half. And now please think about this paragraph in light of what we just talked about with Rahm's career, particularly in the White House. America endured a war sold on false premises, a bailout of bankers issuing entirely toxic debt, and a massive public effort to prop up auto executives who were building cars that weren't selling. Is it any wonder so many middle-class taxpayers resent the elites? The middle class has been forced to bail them out from their own mistakes time and time again, and yet the beneficiaries of that goodwill haven't apologized, let alone taken responsibility. America's middle class is Cinderella, and the nation's elite are her evil stepsisters. What? Only now it's the stepsisters who get to marry the prince. It's infuriating. Oh, that's great writing. I see why they hired him. It <laughs> yes. clearly wasn't just back glad handling and elite, you know, prom self promotion. Clearly, they're just like his prose is too sparkling. <laughs> so, I mean, other than the Iraq War, he's hanging, which he supported. He which, ran yeah. in two thousand two as a pro war candidate. So he's saying, like, the the problem is like, and then the, which he didn't need to do. This he's running <laughs> to represent Chicago. Look, we're, we're not. There's no point talking about who killed who. <laughs> but he's saying, like he's basically hanging the auto bailout and the bailout of the overall of Wall Street of like you know which was true, especially the Wall Street bailout. Yeah, that was awful, and they didn't need to do it. There's other things they could have done, but there was some guy. There were a couple guys in charge at that time and who decided that there was no other alternative. And, and, saying, was also, and, he, and he was also shaving hundreds of billions of dollars off the stimulus that, you know. Yeah, and I, and I get into this in the book, too, that he was instrumental in one of the biggest scandals around the Wall Street bailout, which was the AIG bonuses. Ooh, oh, yeah. Yes. You remember that? Oh, yeah. this, remember and bonuses. this, everyone that I talked to who lived through that in the Senate and the House says, like, that's the moment we lost everything like we lost the public right there they they absolutely turned on us and we took the blame for everything and this was something that Rahm Emanuel and Tim Geithner pushed for Chris Dodd of all people who was the chairman of the bank committee wanted to make sure that there were no bonuses anywhere near this bailout they said no that's it's that's that appalled them it's unconstitutional oh, it's, not it's not fair these contracts are sacred <laughs> these bonuses are written down on paper you cannot take them away from these bankers who have worked so hard. So they insisted. They ended up going around Chris Dodd, going directly to a staffer on the committee <laughs> to get the language changed. They ended Chris Dodd's career over oh this. Oh, my God. Went on to become a lobbyist for Hollywood. So he's fine. Yeah, now he's at the MPAA. <laughs> but, uh, Actually, he got run out of there, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, uh, man. Separate. He got lost Jack Valencia's old job. Uh, he, yeah, he, I forget the beef that ran him well, out of there. I mean, to quote Rom in this paragraph, it's infuriating. Yeah. So uh, skipping ahead here, he, he also goes, says, maybe the clearest early manifestation was the Iraq war. After 9-11, the Washington elite claimed that the country needed to neutralize Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Congress and the media largely went along for the ride. But one trillion and 5,000 lives and 16 years later, by the way, uh, it's actually quite a bit more than 5,000 oh, lives. Way <laughs> um, but, uh, and 16 years lives, later... Lives that matter. Yeah. Uh, 16 years later, the public has been told that those weapons of mass destruction had not existed after all. Yet as clear as that became, no one ever took it on the chin. No one from the Bush administration ever took responsibility. You know why? It's because Obama came into office immediately and said, we're looking forward, not yep, backward, yep. and eschewed any investigations of the run-up to the Iraq war, or let alone prosecutions of any of these people. And, and the, the second that Pelosi won uh, the House in 2006, she said, I'm taking impeachment off the table, if that sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> taking impeachment off the table. Wow. I, I totally forgot. Yeah, this is Nancy's career. She, yeah, should she's, have, she's good. she should have that on like a little embossed thing on her desk. I'm taking impeachment <laughs> off the table. Should be on the floor. Impeachment like, should be just yeah. on her floor. <laughs> but like, so so Ram is saying here, like, there's a middle class revolt because of these things that you know elites perpetrated and caused great catastrophe at huge cost in both you know as our favorite thing, blood and treasure for the taxpayer. But like at the time, if you had tried to let's say make anyone in the Bush administration or Wall Street take it on the chin, guess who you'd be running up against? trying to stop you from doing that. I was, I was appalled when it looked like Rahm Emanuel might get one of these gigs. And he's, I guess his, he's already got a gig with ABC, too. It was clear that he was trying oh, to yeah. come up 
Wait, what's it. his ABC gig? Oh, he's going to be a contributor for their news as well. Oh, I thought like he was a... getting like a sitcom or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully. We, Modern we can, family. We can hope. Yeah. The Emanuels. Him and his <laughs> shitty brothers. Yeah, him and his asshole brothers. <laughs> but I've, I've actually flipped on this idea. I, I think it's delightful that he has this column. Well, it's good. It's like, it's like the perfect, you know, vi- I mean, this is the Atlantic. This is what they're, this, I mean, this is perfect. So he goes, uh, Middle class families paid both blood and treasure. There's that phrase. Oh God, shut but the, the people up. who had made the worst foreign policy CC decision in U.S. history never owned their failure. The same thing happened during the Great Recession. The nation's banking elite had lent billions to home buyers without any realistic hope of making good on their debts. Their irresponsible lending not only precipitated a global financial meltdown, but also necessitated a bailout from the nation's financially stressed middle class taxpayers. Yet, even after being bailed out, the nation's banking executives never faced any real consequences. No one went to jail. They never had to repay the personal fortunes they'd made by passing out those bad loans. Once again, the middle class was called to bail out the elites who were responsible for the mess while the elites got off scot-free. This is so fucking perverse. <laughs> what a sick puppy. I mean, yeah. he's, not, he's never going to run for office again, presumably. His political career is done. Right. And he, he actually floated his name out there for president as one of these two dozen. <laughs> what? Uh, it looks like he's decided against that. <laughs> But yeah, he was kick, he was kicking himself around. Fuck. Well, then never never mind. Maybe this is all uh, this is on the Nixonian revamp that is like a long march back to relevance. Because otherwise, why would you d- write this? Why would you just lie like that? Other than you just getting off on it because you're a little picky. Also, he spent uh, about two years in the private sector between the White House and and running for Congress. And in that time, he earned something like nineteen million dollars. Uh, brokering private deals between people that he'd met while he was at the Clinton White House uh, and and shaking down nuclear power companies for for money like he so he he walked away with an extraordinary amount of money who knows what he's worth now if he had 19 million dollars you know that he made in well, a year in 1999 well look he's he's not a fat cat he's a middle class tax right middle class <laughs> middle class <laughs> so uh, and, yeah like, his use of, his constant use of middle class is just so 90s so he goes uh washington wasn't wrong to prevent a global financial meltdown obama was certainly right to save the domestic auto industry against my advice but those decisions came at a real cost After the Recovery Act had passed and the auto bailout was rolling, we had a fierce debate inside the White House about how to sequence our pushes for healthcare, climate change, and financial reform. As the White House Chief of Staff, I argued unsuccessfully that the American people needed the catharsis of seeing that the bankers who had gotten the country into this mess were being forced to take responsibility, that faith in government would plummet if we failed to deliver some Old Testament justice. Yeah, he was in there saying stone these guys to death. <laughs> yeah. Can I just pause? I don't think that's true. I think you might be lying. Can I just pause and say nobody actually gave a shit about the auto bailout. Oh, uh, not the uh, auto bailout. Like, right. right. Yeah. Other than nobody people negative. who loved it in the state of right. Michigan. People yeah. who loved it, like you said, bought in the state of Michigan. Right. Outside, of course, of the, 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 the racial dog whistles about Detroit. Yeah. So here he goes. I'm um, just skipping ahead. Because your Democrats have become increasingly cognizant of the anger. But too often, this this middle class anger, he goes, but too often they've drawn the wrong conclusions. The answer certainly isn't socialism. (laughs) Middle class voters currently... Shut the fuck up about the fucking middle class. That's not a thing. God damn it. Middle class voters certainly presume that elites already control the government. So why would they want to give the bureaucracy any more power? Rather, Democrats need to become the party of justice. They need to demand accountability from bad actors and point out where Republicans would give them a pass. Every time Democrats look at a problem, they think of a program. And while those programs often point the way forward, Democrats need to focus their energy on convincing the middle class that they share their values more than just their economic interests. What does that mean? Yeah, what is it fucking yeah, what talking is about? It, yeah. Does he want to like, get SEAL Team 6 to just like murder Lloyd Blankfein? If he does, I'm fine with that. I mean, I'd vote for him. If That's that cool. Case. But and but he's, he's he's saying like we do that instead of reordering society in any way that's that's wait wait so we know we know hey we, uh, you know Democrat, when, when Democrats face a problem they want to write a solution or something we need <laughs> to spend our time convincing the middle class of our values like through podcasting you know what this literally sounds like this sounds like the the what the Jacobins did with the Reign of Terror like when, when at least according <laughs> to Marx no I'm serious. Uh, Marx's analysis of the of the French Revolution, uh, the the Reign of Terror era was is that because it was made up, it was a revolution made up of lawyers and, and like the emerging bourgeois, and it was like a, a class project in that sense. And the productive forces didn't exist for socialism to really you know be a viable option. 
and the vast, the people of Paris wanted change. They wanted lives that were good. They couldn't give them that. They didn't have the inclination or ability to f- create a, a social order that was just. What they could do is cut off the heads of all the fucking asshole royals and fancy noble people who they hated. And he's basically saying, yeah, just do that instead. But to Lori Laughlin of Full I House. I guess, right. yeah. And it's, it's a version of, of Joe Biden's solution, which is to take Donald Trump behind the gym and beat him up. <laughs> yeah. Tom Perez is going to hit somebody with a two-by-four. Because, right, they don't have an actual yeah. program as... Emanuel and the says. thing is, if they wanted to kill people, I mean, that would at least be something. I mean, if I mean, but if, he's clearly not he, talking about if that. If he wants to give the Chicago Police Department treatment to, yeah, Lloyd Blankfein or Jamie Dimon, by all means. But something tells me that's not what he's talking about. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, here, he says, like, you know, we need to we need to become a party of justice in bringing these bad actors to justice. Now, you could you could disagree with me, but like to my mind, you cannot do anything close to bringing the bad actors in American pe- politics to justice without something that looks like socialism. Well, you have to make them less powerful yeah. or else they'll just prevent ever being held accountable so because just, they have all the fucking money. Well, okay, just to finish <laughs> it out here, it goes, there is more to voters than their wallets. To do that, Democrats need to prove them Prove to them that they know the difference between right and wrong. How? What? And, and that begins okay. with owning the terms accountability and Jesus responsibility. Jesus fucking Christ, I'm going to jump out of this goddamn window. <laughs> They need to own those terms. Democrats need to be the ones demanding uh-huh. that those who fall short, no matter how privileged, be made to answer for their own decisions. Theater. Every one we'll of go us. Go around with a big boot. And we're we're going to kick them in the boot. We're going to give them the boot. Hey, all you naughty because rich people, we're going to give you the boot. Every one of us should have to live by the same moral and ethical codes. The nation's elite shouldn't have any special license to take the easy way out. And I think it's interesting that he opens the article talking about the college admission scandal because I think actually that's what he's talking about. He, I think he's basically signaling that the yeah, Democrats throw the book need, at to, Felicity. need to fucking yeah. like strap Felicity Huffman and William H. Macy into the electric chair like Julius and Ethel Rosenberg <laughs> and just flip throw, throw the switch on these Hollywood scoff laws because that's the elite he's talking about. Yeah. He's not talking about the people who actually have any fucking power. No, 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 no. Like there's not, he's not talking about putting healthcare executives in the stockades or anything like that. No, he's talking about Lori Laughlin and yeah. fucking their shitty influencer daughters. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm, it has to be. I mean, he, it, how do you? God damn it! How do you write that? <laughs> it's a breathtaking. I'm just I'm deeply grateful that he wrote this and yeah. that he's back in the news because when I was writing the book, I was like, yes, Rom's gonna be my main character because he's been such an influential uh, figure in the party over the last thirty years, but. Are people over him? You know, he's been gone from Washington since 2010. Are people not going to care about Rahm Emanuel? Thank you, Rahm, for coming back and, and showing <laughs> he's us sh- who He's are. bringing it. He's going to be a recurring figure, I think, if he keeps writing shit like this. Because you start with just, I hate, I hate it when people refer to things that public, people in public say as gaslighting. Because it's just <laughs> lying. You, know, you can only be gaslit by, like, a, an intimate p- partner. Yeah. But that... Doing having his career yes. and then being like, you know what? We really didn't. Uh, we didn't give these elites the what for. Hey, you know and that the, war. The, 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 the was the, like uh, that is like uh, the gaslight. I feel like yeah. I'm being gaslighted. The, the, there the, for yeah. A the problem is, you know, there's always Donald. And the weird thing about this is that, like, reading in between the lines here, and actually not even reading in between them, just reading the lines, he's basically blaming Obama for Donald Trump. Yeah. Which is like, in a way, I mean, like, I mean, I kind of agree with that in certain respects, right. but like. At every level, like it was, was there. Blame it's yourself. You're the talking worst about yourself. Parts of his entire, all the worst decisions, and because he was the chief of staff when they had when the only time when they actually had control of the of the political agenda, and they fucked the dog completely. That was when he was chief of staff. Then they like had that revolving door of like weirdo cat men and. And, and like one Bill, of them daily. Yeah, was, one of the yeah. dailies, like dipshit brothers who couldn't <laughs> even get elected. Didn't Mayor even, of Chicago. Didn't even make it past the runoff. Didn't make it into the runoff. A daily brother couldn't make it into the runoff to be mayor of Chicago. What? How did he get out of his house every day to be fucking uh, chief of staff? Well, that's wrong. But uh, Ryan, I, we, we can't let you go here without talking about another character. Sort of a, a new challenger has like thrown ent- entered the <laughs> arena to become sort of the new Rom in a way. Like this, this guy's really trying hard to be the new Rom. Well, Ryan sent me this article the other day, and I got to I gotta say, I really admire the, the pissed guy energy that this guy exudes. A lot exudes. of energy. We're talking about Josh Gottheimer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gottheimer? Okay, so, so, Gottheimer? Uh, so, Ryan, could you just, just describe briefly who Josh Gottheimer is and then describe to us 
what happened at the Teaneck Democratic Municipal oh, Committee so meeting? <laughs> well, he's he's a protege of Mark Penn. Oh, uh, that's good. Oh, that's just, all I need to hear. Yeah. Why isn't he running for president? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he he won in 2016 a a seat Im- impressively that was gerrymandered for a Republican in, in North, Jersey. Northern Jersey. So he represents the, the burbs and all the bankers. He represents the, the Tony Soprano part. Bergen County. Jersey, yeah. Right, yeah, yes, he the does. sanitation people. He does. So, so he won that seat in 2016. Uh, so after, uh, so Trump is elected and there's all of this push from these indivisible groups and, and locals say, we want you to do town halls. You know, we want to yell at you. We want to push you to oppose Trump. If you don't do it, we're going to put a cardboard cut out of you up there, and that's going to show up on the local news. He hates town halls, so but he finally agrees. He's like, okay, Teaneck, what was it called? The Teaneck the Municipal... Teaneck Municipal Democratic Committee. Yeah, Teaneck Municipal Democratic Committee. I will come to your town hall. We can't, we're not going to call it a town hall, and there can be no press, and the questions must be written down, but I will do this public event for you. Like, so he needs the questions in advance as well? Written down yeah. in advance, yeah, pre-screened. Uh, and so... He's he's going about his town hall or whatever whatever they're calling it, and his staff notices that there's an old man in the audience with a notebook, he's taking notes, and they figure out it's this guy Jim Norman who'd been laid off a mass layoff from the Bergen County record, and he's trying to start a community newspaper in Teaneck, and they panic <laughs> because they know <laughs> that Josh Godheimer does not like the press. And so they, they, they approach him kind of quietly. It eventually becomes a little bit of a scene as Jim Norman, to his credit, defends the freedom of the press. He's like, I'm here with my notebook. I'm going to stay. I'm going to take photographs. Democratic club guy even tells him, look, we're not going to bar Jim Norman from, yeah, our, from our event. Like, he can be here. It's a public event. He can be here with a notebook. He's an institution. It's Jim Norman's institution. He's now a boat maker. He's retired. He's made, made, making boats. This old man who wants to make a, 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 a out his home newspaper, newspaper. Yeah, yeah. a weekly, newspaper. a weekly. By the way, that's it out of his garage. I remember or something. reading that was a Mac- Iglesias take from a few years ago, where he said that the, the, one of the byproducts of media consolidation is that there's no more local press anymore, and the way the, what was going to fill that void was retirees who had nothing better to do were just going to go to you know, s- uh, city council meetings and things like that and just take notes and write them up somewhere. Right, as always. So, so it's like, yeah. this is, yeah. he was doing he was the Iglesias' doing dream. So, so what happens when, when Josh finds out about so this? So they, they come up, they're like, event went great, Josh. Terrific job. <laughs> just FYI, there was a so guy like he in there. didn't even have a gaff or anything. Nothing. Nothing. And I talked to his staffers who despised him. Like, he was great. It was fine. They loved him. <laughs> it's like, so... They're like it went great. So like, like, like the the local guy is basically going to write something in his like in his like you know his neighborhood newsletter, newsletter yeah. to be like yeah. Josh Gottheimer speaks on issues at yes. local local yeah. meeting, and he's and they're like so they tell him that and then he's just like just eyes start glowing. <laughs> just what? He's like get what the fuck did you just say? He's like get me his notes. Like, what the fuck is he Saddam Hussein? <laughs> so they, so they, they they try to get the guy's notes. And this guy's not giving up his notes. Uh he he's getting louder and louder. Not not Jim, but Josh. Uh so his staff kind of like nudges him outside. By the time he gets out in the street, he's now having a full blown meltdown. Uh, they go in this, the Senate majority leader, Loretta Weinberg is there. They, they go and get her and they're like, can you help us with Josh? And she's like, she's like, Josh, I've known Jim for like 20 years. Whatever he writes, is going to be fine. Don't, don't worry about it. He and I, we work together on this, on saving this big tree downtown. It's going <laughs> to be fine. So charming. I, I emailed her. She said, I don't have anything to add. <laughs> she's still Senate majority leader. Uh, and so he, it doesn't work. He's still demanding the notes. He's he's screaming louder and louder in the middle of the street. And then he spots the the car of the staffer who drove him to this event. I guess he blames that car for bringing him to this <laughs> godforsaken scene. <laughs> he goes over to the car and just starts raining blows down upon the roof of this of this staffer's car. He goes car. beast mode on the car. Beast mode. He goes beast mode on the car like one of those interstitial game, the mini games from Street Fighter Two, where you have to just, 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 just destroy or save the rest. The <laughs> and then he has a and then he has a new idea, and, and he tells his staff tonight. I want everything I said transcribed <laughs> so that, that it would be war ready. 
<laughs> for when this could dispatch war against, against, the, the, against the Norton when family the, circular. We're, <laughs> we're ready for we're ready we're ready to strike back when the guy like gets it from underneath his windshield when he goes out to work in the morning and so reads it. At the time, he had this, a site called the TNECIndependent dot com, and it, you can still find the cached article if if you if you Google it right. Uh, he did end up writing something the next day, and he told me that they he actually did get some quibbles from the Gottheimer. Uh, crew. He said he doesn't remember if he changed anything. It's a completely mundane uh, write up of the event. It's it's positive. P- said people liked him. Here's what he said. Blah blah. That's it. And so uh, the descriptions of that event from the staff that were there are like just I've never seen anything like it. But it was it wasn't out of character. It was just the most extreme well, expression I mean, of the like, character the, the, that yeah, they had like, seen. The, the piece that you wrote of this like just came out very recently, but Gottheimer came on my on my radar because you wrote like the, the original piece about him. Where it's like I read I had like had no idea who this guy is. And I just like it was one of those things where like you have the feeling reading it where it's just like the bench of just psychos and just sadists and assholes that are involved in politics, Democratic Party, Republican like it's just it's endless. And you, you, you wrote a write-up of him where I was like, I cannot believe this guy is real. Because like you said, he, he got on your radar because he tried to shit-can the anti-Yemen war resolution. Right. That was one of his first things to do. Right. And, and he was doing it on behalf of the pro-Israel lobbies. He was saying, uh, if, and he gets a ton of money from the Saudi lobby. He was saying, if, if, you, if you don't criminalize BDS on the same day, then I'm going to I have enough votes to take down this and like yeah, he tried to just totally big dick it and yeah. just bluff everyone yeah. and like he was like I have the votes to kill this and he had nothing he didn't he had ended up having four votes and then also the other the other amazing story from that original piece about this guy is him approaching just like cornering Rashida Tlaib in with a as you described it a burn book of her worst quotes because you talking about no that? not hers oh. It's, Oh, is so, some, some hers of them. and oh, some yeah, Omar's. Was, uh, old on Omar's. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she said he was confusing the two of them constantly oh in the God. conversation. But yeah, he's it's a white binder uh, with uh, with printouts and and words highlighted that he just that he flips through with her. You said this. You said this. You met with this person. This person is related to this terrorist organization. Uh, just like going at her, and that's it's like when they both got elected in the same year. Well, he, he, oh, pre- no, he got elected in oh, 2016. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I actually saw some ads for him uh, on my local news because, you know, Northern Jersey, a lot of the same uh, media markets. And I remember, it's, you know, it was very generic. Him and his wife, we're going to fight for New Jersey families. And I remember just thinking, well, I remember looking at him and I remember thinking, this guy's a freak. That was him? Yeah. That, oh, my God. Those ads that yeah. just always start with like him and his wife in front of the garage yeah, or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like him. the old guy? And I remember just, no, he's oh. not that old. He's, he's, he's not that old. And I remember just thinking, you might be thinking of somebody else because they all do the same thing. They, yeah, all, all the North Jersey fucking shitheads. It's all the same thing. Oh, th- those ads are delightful. And, and and I mean, obviously, it's a fair bet he's awful because you know he's a Northern Jersey Democrat. You know, fucking suburban hellscapes. But God, I just looked at him and just thought that guy's a fucking freak. Oh yeah, yeah. You, yeah oh you, yeah. You look and then I find out guy. very shortly afterwards. <laughs> and, <laughs> absolutely, and it, it makes sense. But like, my point is like, what he got in there like what a year before. It's like, who the fuck are you, dude? Yeah. Like, yeah. And then you said that he also went beast mode on Maxine Waters, who's like okay, a, yes. a you know, elder statesman of the party. Yeah, he, it's, this, was two, this was two years ago also. He, uh, it's, the Financial Services Committee is trying to repeal Obamacare. Democrats are all trying to hang together. Stephen Lynch, uh, Massachusetts congressman, has an amendment to the repeal that uh, it's, it's something that Wall Street doesn't like. Yeah. It's this fiduciary rule. And Gottheimer's like, pull this. I, I, ran, I ran on this. I, uh, you cannot make me vote on this. Pull it. And Lynch is like, no, I'm not pulling this amendment. And so he goes to Maxine Waters. He's like, pull this. She's like, no, I'm not making him pull this. Takes him to an ante room, starts screaming at both of them in front of other staff members and members of Congress, screaming at Maxine Waters and Stephen Lynch, saying, I will burn this motherfucker down. <laughs> He's, I, he says, I have the votes, the moderates, we're going to walk on this. There's somebody in the room with a, a staff member. He's like, no, no, you're, you're on your own on this. <laughs> uh, he's like, fuck this. So he, he's like, I'm calling Nancy. And in front of them, <laughs> he, ca- he calls Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> explains this horrible amendment they're trying to make him vote on. And Nancy Pelosi's like, Josh, sounds like a good amendment. Vote for it. <laughs> and hangs up on him. 
<laughs> and then calls other junior members of the committee. I, I heard Josh is agitating. Don't take the bait. I want you to vote for this amendment. So this guy, I mean, like he's he's he he thinks of himself as like the next Rom, or and he behaves like you know Malcolm Tucker, but without the juice, with <laughs> yep. just the personality disorder. <laughs> and I mean, like we were talking before we start recording, like where it's just like. The thing is, like, you can try to be Rom, but it takes a little bit more finesse than just yelling and cursing at people. Like, you need a little uh, something yeah. else you there, need, like something like pur purse strings, access to cash, yeah. something like that. Or well, he, he like, does if, have if, that. If, He's a great fundraiser. Yeah, if but you, you need something, if, and you need more people on your. You need like a group that you lead. He doesn't really lead any. He thinks. I think he from that. Just it sounds like he thinks he's like the leader of the new moderates or something. Yeah, like if that. you're going beast mode on a part car because you just lost your uh, fucking battle to the death with an old man <laughs> self publishing <laughs> yeah, a yes. newspaper for his family and neighbors. Also, and here is <laughs> you're uh, not wrong. <laughs> this is good. Wait. So a uh, I I got more reaction from members of Congress from this article than anything uh, anything I've written. They were just absolutely uh, eating it up. So this this is an email I got from a, a member of the New Democrat Coalition, which is this is the like pro Wall Street thing that Gottheimer is a part of. <laughs> Wrote to me. Uh, Let's just say there are many Democratic colleagues who are enjoying reading this articles you're doing on him. It was the talk of one meeting I was in. <laughs> They're pretty giddy reciting the car anecdote. <laughs> He's one of the most unpopular colleagues around here. Oh, I am, I am looking forward to years of more coverage about Josh Gottheimer. <laughs> and I, I, I do want to say, if anyone out there is a budding citizen journalist in or about New Jersey, uh, you know, check out, you know, that check out Josh Gottheimer's town halls. That's a good well, place he won't for do us to He won't do town halls. What he does, he, ca he calls them like cup of coffee with Joe or cup of Joe with Josh or Go something like that. Go get a like cup that. of Joe with Josh. So got, but he, that doesn't, he make doesn't sense. give you, he doesn't give you much warning. Joe. That's, but horrible go, go find a cup of Josh with Joe or whatever <laughs> and like go with a notepad and see what happens. Absolutely. And also, you know, hey, you, you, a lot of journalism takes place uh, on social media now. Just follow Josh. Ask him some questions. Send him pictures and notebooks online. He's going to love this. <laughs> take, a, I, take an Uber. He, I, you know what? I mean, I've been watching this Democratic presidential field shape up, and I really feel like it needs a new voice. I think that he should run. Godheimer 2020. I think Godheimer 2020. Let's make it happen. He's uh, got the money. Yeah. By the way, before we uh, close things out here, a uh, little bit of uh, house cleaning. First off, uh, Marianne Mindset continues to dominate the country. Woo! Open <laughs> that third eye, people. This, Get it squeegeed clean. She just made the debate. are yep. spreading. Uh, first, she, after our uh, landmark episode where we discussed getting Marianne in the debate, she first uh, got enough donors to qualify for the debate. But because there are so many candidates, there are various tie-breaking procedures. It was reported today that Marianne has achieved enough poll support to basically guarantee her a place in one of the two of the first Democratic debates. We will levitate the debate stage. It will be four to six feet off of the ground by the end of that debate. Also, uh, well, let's follow up on this one. About two months ago, after the release of the Mueller report, uh, Matt Christman and I made one oh. of our famous bets uh, where oh. Matt said he thought that the fact that the report more or less exculpates him of the worst serious charges of collusion, that Donald Trump's approval ratings would go up by 10%. That, honestly, what a, I, I, my big problem is that I never really consulted the 538 composites because it was way lower than I thought it was because you would just see things like, oh, 46 Rasmuses or something. Those are all outliers. The well, actual, I, the, the 538 composite approval rating was like never over than 42. And if I'd known that, I probably would have bet 45, well, well, but that I, wouldn't have I, mattered I think, anyway because he actually, he, the, the difference is a 0.1%. <laughs> And it's actually 1.1% less. And I, I just really forgot that no one is paying attention or cares or knows about any of this. Yes. And it is all baked in already. And no one is moving because of anything that happens with it. I'm uh, an idiot. No. It's, 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 you know, it's J.K. Simmons at the end of Burn After Reading. Yes. Like, what do we learn? What do we learn? Uh, I don't know. Nothing. Will, tell him what he's won. I cover, a, what is it, uh, a month of watching The View? A month of watching The View. I cover yeah. Congress and I don't pay much attention to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not looking forward to this. Well, uh, well the deal was it, because it would have been what would it, you would have had to watch something that you would have had to watch the Daily Show. The Daily Show, which is a half an hour. It's four a week, and it's a half hour. And it's half an hour, so I don't have to watch the whole hour. 
I only have to watch the first half hour. That's where all the, and the good, stuff, weeks, good stuff is. Four a week for, and that is that's where they start. Is it that's a week or a month? You, you won't be able well, to turn it off month. for a month. That's yeah. where they talk about issues. Oh god. Uh, and will we will we will get on this after the conclusion of our European yeah, tour. Yeah, we're back and in Matt, the states. And you can also follow Matt for his daily live blogging of. The view. The I, view. Oh God. Oh. Fuck. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, speaking of the tour, uh, ticket due available now by England, uh, <laughs> Glasgow, the capital of England, uh, Manchester, the <clears throat> largest city in England, and London. There are tickets presumably still available. ChapoTrapHouse.com slash tour. If you just click the pictures, it'll take you to a page. Oh, just ignore I, all the I mean, also, I want to push back because you know, uh, you know, we posted that you know. Attention, Eurozone, we're coming, and people got angry. They're like, "You're oh, not the Eurozone, you England bloody is- muppet!" And I'm gonna say, first of all, you're wrong. If England wasn't in the Eurozone, why is the Queen of England the leader of the Eurozone? Why is <laughs> why is Buckingham Palace the capital of the zone? Uh, guess what? Answer, riddle me that. England, your country, is in Europe. That's <laughs> yes, a, and they're in the zone. Yeah, they're it, in uh, the zone of Europe. You fucking asshole. Is it America? Yeah, uh, is it America? Yeah, it's not. Is, is, it, is it China? Doi, is it Asia? Doi, doi, doi. <laughs> <laughs> it's Europe, assholes. You're in the Eurozone. Deal with it. So, and then finally, Ryan Grin, thank you so much for joining us. The book is We've Got People in Stores, May 28th. Yes. Uh, look forward to toasting you for becoming a future uh, uh, a fellow bestseller. There you go. There you go. Definitely check this out. It is, a, it is a very good book, and it's a very good history, one that we uh, condensed and more or less just bullshitted uh, in the liberal chapter of our own book. There's a lot of tea. If you love sipping and spilling there is, tea. There's a lot of tea. And I actually thought about like Chapo listeners were like, in my mind as I'm like, who, who wants to read this book? Actually, it's two. Chapo listeners and then like the indivisible wine moms. <laughs> like those, like both of those groups. Bring them this together. is the we benefit must, from hearing that, that history. will be the marriage of yeah. our two it, houses. Yeah, exactly. It'll be, it's Ryan Grimm and Marianne Mindset are going to bring go. together these two feuding clans. Yes. Yes. We're going to unite under the, the banner of good chill vibes and the orb. Yeah, a blood alliance to, <laughs> to defeat the uh, Emperor Cheeto. Emperor Cheeto. <laughs> All right, guys. Till next time. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.